Many thanks for watching KTN News. Welcome back to Africa Speaks as we continue to give you stories making headlines. But about now, Africa is considered the next frontier when it comes to technology. Now, through vast availability and penetration of technology, Africa is seen as king. But just what are we doing as a continent to take advantage of what we have and what are we doing to protect it? In studio with me is Albert Kimani, head of programs Power Land Project. Albert, welcome to the studio. Thank you so We're much. We're talking about technology today and uh, some of the solutions that we get from it. Just how good is the penetration when we talk about technology in Africa? Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, penetration, uh, it's something that we are still working on and government looking at all the investments they're making, uh, making sure that uh, connectivity is there, making sure that some of these skills and curriculum is aligned to the tech needs of the country mm -hmm. and the future generations. I think there are bold steps being made, but we still have quite a way to go. And when we talk about technology, we realize that the current administration, especially through CBC, technology in it is one of the curriculums that are in there. Just how important is it for a country, say, as Kenya, to introduce technology and the syllabus from that young age? I, I think you've said it. Uh, Africa is looking forward to being um, like the next frontier when it comes to tech. And it starts from building those skills and that sort of awareness from a very young age of the population and building those skills and speciality within the labor force of a country. So I think uh, those are still uh, steps within the right direction. Uh, and again, still quite some bit of way to go to get to where we need to be. Now, the fourth industrial revolution is the next big thing that is going to happen. And Africa is considered to be at the forefront in leading this conversation. As we move forward, how then should the governments come on board in making sure that Africa gets to win and take advantage of what we have. I, I think uh, we, we are on the onset of the 4IR, as, as it's called, and uh, this is one of the revolutions that Africa gets to be live at. We've missed all the other <laughs> three before. Um, so I, I think Professor Ndongo contributed to one of uh, a good paper uh, when it comes to 4IR and what governments need to be doing for this. Uh, first of all, the skills mismatch. Uh, we need to build uh, skills uh, to support and drive Africa's participation uh, in this revolution and for us to draw as much value uh, in it as possible. Uh, we're looking also at regulations, especially when you think about the technologies that come with 4AR, including AI, including blockchain, including IoT. We need some form of regulations and guidelines for these. Uh, think about infrastructure for the, uh, that's supposed to be an anchor for these internet connectivity, uh, power and energy to drive all these. Uh, we are looking at access to capital to build some of these uh, sort of, uh, um, again, infrastructure to support these. So all these things uh, need to be aligned and, uh, and I'm happy that, um, you know, we are, we are heading in the right direction. Now, when you're talking about policies being put in place then comes in the policy makers and how important it is for them to consume this research that we have to be able to build the proper infrastructure that will help us towards accessing 4IR so that we don't become that continent that again misses the most important revolution. So for policy makers, how should they address it and approach it? I think uh, first is having the right people uh, around you uh, in charge of policy. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we've uh, started on the right foot. Um, and not only in Kenya, I think uh, most people and most governments across the continent are coming alive to the need, uh, to the fact that they need some of these sort of qualities and skills in the leadership and uh, policy makers. Mm -hmm. uh, so beyond that is making it very intentional and involving the citizenry in understanding uh, the directions and the steps the government is taking. Because if you talk about coding in early, early uh, school, uh, junior school, uh, pre-primary, so you need people to understand why uh, it is important for the children uh, to understand this and not the other thing. And, uh, and for also them to participate actively uh, in s building some of these skills. And when we talk about uh, technology for IR, we talk about an industry that is potential in terms of job employment. We talk about, let's talk about Twitter, we talk about Facebook, Instagram, and mm -hmm. the job uh, 
opportunities that they have created. So as, as a republic, how do we look at technology as a means upon which we can sort out the unemployment problems that we have? Um, yeah, so we have, uh, we are the youngest uh, continent yes. uh, with over 60 percent of the population being under the age of, um, under the age of 25. Uh, compared to the 25% mm -hmm. global average. So this means that we need to provide a, a, a way to economically empower uh, our young people. And uh, technology becomes one of those enabling uh, sort of features to be able to, to do this. Uh, it blurs borders, meaning you can be in Kenya and still supporting projects or other, other things across the continent. Uh, you're in Kenya and you're working, supporting a, uh, some form of, of value production in Rwanda or Botswana and so forth. Uh, so we can see technology being, again, uh, a way of, uh, you know, enabling young people to access uh, dignified jobs, mm -hmm. if I may put it that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. now, there is the issue of deploying the technology, there is consuming the technology, but we tend to find that this uh, is an area that is considered expensive for, mm. for the locals out here. Yeah. So how do we then make it cheap uh, yeah. for people to be able to access it mm. and in return get to also have a population that understands what you're doing? So at the end of the day, it's a win-win situation. I think uh, being intentional, mm -hmm. and especially from the policymakers' uh, perspective. Uh, second is the collaboration within the private sector. We have a lot of initiatives from all these companies uh, targeting young people. Um, and this is one of the ways of supplementing uh, access to uh, uh, these skills. Uh, maybe like, uh, for example, what you're doing uh, is providing this scholarship uh, where young people can access uh, some of these skills uh, without them paying anything for where they are because it's needed. Um, so th those are some of the initial steps, um, you know, um, breaking down some of these barriers to access those skills. Mm -hmm. And even when we talk about the private sector, we know the government is putting in place a lot of infrastructure to make sure that the technology gets to penetrate that through the introduction of CBC and the curriculums, that technology becomes a way of life. But mm -hmm. moving forward, what should the private sector do to become part of this conversation? Uh, I think this is a, a broader conversation mm -hmm. that um, no one can tackle o o on their own. own. And uh, we get to situations where everyone is doing their own little mm -hmm. things in their own little corners. And we need to come together and realize when it comes to uh, providing some of these solutions, um, it, you know, more can be done when we do it together and when we synchronize efforts within the private sector. Um, private sector and also the government. So we are complementing uh, each other's efforts. So I think that will be one of the uh, initial steps to, uh, to start. And we can see some of those efforts uh, from the government in one area or the other. Now, when we talk about technology, there is the broader growing competition that there exists from the rest of the world. As Africa, how do we take advantage of the young population that we have, of the infrastructure that we have? Mm -hmm. Because even Africa is considered to have the highest rate of mobile penetration. So how do we enhance all these so that we are not found flat-footed, we don't know what to do. So what are some of the conversations that policymakers, that the NGOs can mm. do, private sector can do, just so we are at a better competing ground? Uh, I think when you think about Africa being the youngest continent, it means, yes, we have, um, you know, the market and the labor force. Mm -hmm. Uh, so then the conversation becomes, uh, uh, needs to move around from, you know, uh, you know what do we do with the, these young people to yeah. um, exactly what direction we need to take them to, as opposed to uh, being worried about young people being idle. There is all these opportunities within the digital uh, space. Uh, all this value that can be unlocked and utilize uh, these young people uh, to, you know, unlock their value within this uh, uh, space. And one includes uh, upskilling and reskilling uh, some of these young people. And it's not Im uh, impossible, it can be done. And Kenya is considered the silicon sa uh, savanna. Yeah. You know, it's the silicon savanna because mm -hmm. talk about anything tech. 
uh, mobile money, everything started from Kenya. Yeah. As we move forward, uh, the next question then comes the patenting of some of these products that we have because we find some of these are products that we have from Kenya mm. because of lack of knowledge on how to go about patenting and registering things, yeah. they get to go out as Powerland Project. Mm. What are you doing to help these young people with great minds, great skills to just harness what is theirs and to get to reap benefits from that? Um, so we've tried to innovate uh, our approach towards upskilling and building task skills, not just in Kenya but yeah. across Africa mm -hmm. because our program uh, is across Africa, the continent. Uh, so one of the ways we are approaching that is uh, a project-based approach towards training young people. So this is not theoretical where you're just going and attending exams and uh, ticking A's and B's and, uh, you know, going through. You're actually building something. So we are seeing for you to get through the program, you get to submit an app, mm -hmm. a project. So some of these are very, very brilliant ideas across the ecosystems. You have agri-tech, uh, you have projects under IoT, you have fintech, you have health tech, you know, solutions that are, are impactful uh, to, to the continent, essentially. Uh, so we are looking at how to also uh, build on that momentum and, you know, support and uh, uh, accelerate some, some of these brilliant ideas uh, to unlock the value for these young people. And as we talk about all that, we have a middle class that is growing and a middle class that is growing means more purchasing power. Yeah. So as we move forward, where do we look at our tech space as Kenya and in terms of revenue, where shall we be sitting, say, in the next five years? Um, service delivery. Yeah. I think as, as wealth, as we continue growing our wealth, uh, you see... Um, you know, growing uh, purchasing power and the need for luxury, uh, you know, products uh, and convenience, those products that cover the convenient sort of uh, spectrum in terms of uh, consumption. So there are still very, very many opportunities to innovate value around service delivery, as we can see what people are doing. Um, you know, logistics. Uh, you don't need to be going to a shop to get your uh, groceries and yeah. your supplies. Um, so we have a lot of opportunities to take advantage of uh, the growing middle class and provide services for, for this sort of category of people. And when we talk about growing middle class, President William Ruto recently announced that Kenya will be launching its first mobile phone probably next year. Mm. What does this mean for the tech community? Wow. Um, I think it's putting us on the map. Uh, we are already on the map, but it's really solidifying Kenya as, uh, you know, the next place to be. And we are not alone. We are competing with other sort of uh, giants across uh, the continent, Egypt, Nigeria, South Africa. They're all coming up and they're serious on also putting their prints on the map. Uh, so w some of these developments uh, shows that uh, really we are capable of doing this and we have the labor force to do this, second, and also means that uh, investors can come, you know, and find a good return for their investments in Kenya. And in Powerland Project, uh, what are some of the projects that you're currently doing uh, here in Kenya yeah. and in helping people just be more tech savvy? Um, so Powerland Project is, uh, we are an impact organization. Mm -hmm and we're looking to unlock value for young people across the continent uh, through tech skills. As we can see, uh, one of the driving forces uh, for what we can do for young people is giving them sort of these skills for them to, you know, provide value for themselves. So we are training young people on how to develop, to become uh, software developers. Mm -hmm. So we have modules, a uh, fully online program uh, with instructors behind the scene. And um, yeah, uh, it's a scholarship. It doesn't cost you anything other than investment in your time and effort. And how we do that, we connect you in peer groups, learning peer groups from learners across the continent. So you get that uh, Pan-African exposure to uh, issues around Africa because um, there's no much difference between uh, challenges that Kenyan faces on a day-to-day -day life and what's happening in Nigeria, in Botswana, in Uganda. So we are bringing some of these ideas and concepts to young people uh, so that they can also realize uh, the, the markets and uh, the potential for to unlock value uh, goes beyond Kenya. You can still uh, run a business uh, across the continent 
and we are looking uh, to unlock that value uh, for our young people. You've mentioned something very important that this is done through scholarships and yeah. we know that access to such kind of information tends to be a bit expensive as earlier stated. Yes. So if I want to access these services for me, mm -hmm. how do I go about it? Um, so we are on all social media platforms, uh, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, <laughs> Instagram. You have to be there because we are targeting young people. Yeah. Um, uh, we uh, have resources just to advise you on uh, what we expect, what the qualification criteria is, which is very simple. We just need you to be over the age of 18, uh, be computer literate, which most young people have, and maybe access to an internet connected computer or laptop so that you can access so, sort of these services. Um, yeah, so that's where we are and it's very easy to apply. Uh, just go to our website, um, click on the apply button. You don't even need to read a lot of stuff on it and then you can fill in a 10 minutes form and you're good to go. Thank you very much, Albert, Albert Kimani uh, programs head at Power Land Project. Thank Congratulations you. for what you're doing and wish you the very best moving forward as you make this country a tech savvy society. Thank you for having me. Now, the effects of the war in Ukraine are extending beyond Moscow and Kyiv and may be impacting not only people but also wildlife. VOA's Bilal Hussain reports from